I'm going to talk about um, doing a, a browser and a, a browser and native um, SPAs uh, using Clojure Script and Reframe and React Native. Okay, so I will start. Uh, so. I'm Manuel Rivero. Uh, I'm a member of Codesci, a member of Codesci, and I work with, collaborate with some communities here in Barcelona. At the moment, I'm working in a different project uh, with Clojure Script, no? but I would like to start thanking some people that really contributed to this talk. I, I would like to thank uh, my colleague, Frances Guillén, who was the person who introduced me to Clojure Script. And, invite me to participate in this project I'm going to talk about. Uh, he was going to be here, but in the end he couldn't because he had to go to visit some his family in, in the United States. So he couldn't be here. I would like also to thank, thank the Clojure Developers Barcelona community because they, they, have, they have been very supportive and listened to this talk like many times and <laughs> gave me a lot of feedback. And my company, because they are, they, they, they are very supportive and, and very diverse. So we start now. Uh, to put you in context, uh, what we were doing, we were rewriting an application, an, an SPA that was already written in JavaScript. And it's uh, for practicing spelling. It's like a, it's implementing a visual spelling method and we wanted to to rewrite it in Clojure script and also do some change improvements make it of uh, so it could work offline and also we wanted to have a, a native version that we wanted to share as much code as possible between the the browser and the, and the native version so the stack we decided was this one we Clojure script was already decided because we were fanboys, we were wanted to use it, so we didn't look for alternatives, so later we'll talk about that. We use a frame because we, we thought this a very interesting framework, we will talk about that later as well. And <coughs> the frame uses reagent, which is uh, like, it's, it's a very minimal, but very good uh, wrapper around React, but uh, later we were using also the bindings, the, the Clojure script bindings for Expo, uh, so we could have use the same code for both uh, iOS and Android. Okay, and the, the thing that it does is only that instead it's reagent, but instead of using React, it's going to use React Native. It's, it's only changing that. So we'll see. Uh, so it's, if you are in Clo into Clojure script, maybe it's not going to be. We are not going to go into m too many details because I expected people that were from many languages, and we were we wanted to to talk about the, the inter interesting concepts that we learned that we thought that we could be useful for for developing in other things as, as well. So we'll talk about things we have learned during the project. The first one is this one: effects and co-effects. Okay, this is probably one of the most interesting things we, 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 I learned last year, and I wanted to share it. Uh, but first, we, we need to see the, a bit of the reframe architecture, okay? Uh, if you, I don't know if you have experience with Redux, but this architecture is very similar to Redux. It's only that we have some thing here that for the moment, we are going to forget about it, but uh, what you have is a model which is, uh, is going to be an associative structure. Uh, only one, all the state is in only one place. It's inspired by Elm. Then uh, you have your views using React. Uh, and anytime the user uh, produces some type of UI event, uh, we are going to, in, in the views, we are going to translate that into the main event, we are going to have event handlers, which are, in this case, like the reducers or some, something like that. And they are going to evolve 
the, to modify the, the state, okay? And then this is going to produce a reaction, which in the end is going to produce a new screen, and that's what the user is going to see, okay? So it's more or less like the Redux. The Redux is it's only this part that we'll see later. So this is a unidirectional data flow architecture. Uh, this is what they use in the reframe documentation. Is this is the cycle of water because they want to, to tell you that this is a cycle of data. It's data flowing all the time. If you imagine the, the reframe application as a reduce, this is what is going to happen. It's, it's a reduce over the events. You can, at any point in time, uh, the APET state is the result of reducing over all events from the beginning to that point in time, okay? And the combining function uh, for this reduce is going to be the set of reducers. In this case, they are called event handlers, okay? The set of event handlers. Um, so this is great and it works very well uh, when event handlers are pure functions. Because if they are, what you have is local reasoning. Everything you need is there in the function. So the code is really easy to understand. Uh, it's very easy to test. Pure functions are really simple to test. And then you have this events replayability, which is interesting. It's about the reduce we were talking before. But side effects are inevitable, if, or unavoidable. Probably this word doesn't exist. Uh, the thing is that, uh, yeah, unless you want to hit the room, you need to do some, only to hit the room, you need some side effects. So we're going to, to go into that and, and distinguish uh, between two types of side effects. So to be more, a bit more precise, we have side causes that are like the data function requires that <coughs> is not getting through the parameters, okay? And for instance, this is an example of a side cause. It's just getting the date. Okay, this would be a side cost, but yeah, I don't know, you get a random number, it's side cost. You uh, get some environment variable, it's the same, side cost. And then this one we call side effects, <laughs> because it's like what the function does to the world. Okay, I, I uh, send a dispatch of another event, like in this case, after a time I send a dispatch, this is side effect, or I store something in local storage, this is side effect, okay? So it's something that I do to the world. So once we have this vocabulary, we can go on. And this is the question, what's the problem with effectful event handlers, with event handlers that are not pure? Well, the problem is that we are doing action as a, at the distance, we, are, we have lost local reasoning, code is more difficult to think about, they are difficult to test, uh, and we will have to introduce complexity or only in order to, to recover the, the testability, okay? And then all event replayability is lost because they are data that we are not having into account. It's not only the events to go to some point. We need more information that we don't have. Um, so we will end this. Introducing accidental complexity, we need to regain isolation. We are going to use some kind of dependency injection, whatever, and we will need to use test doubles to test it, but the event replayability is still lost. We, we cannot fix that. So only to see an example, this is how we could test uh, one of these eventful, uh, effectful event handlers. This is, uh, we will have to, to create some spies in this case, because it's a side effect. Uh, we will have to inject this fake, this spy uh, dispatcher, but in the production code we'll have the real dispatcher, and then in the end we are going to, to, to do some assertions on, on the arguments of the call, okay? So a lot of complexity. So the question is, is there an easier way to do this? Uh, we were like one month in the project, we had a bunch of those, and we had rolled our own uh, test double uh, framework because we didn't like the ones that were outside. And so uh, Frances told me, okay, they have released this last week, and I think there's something there that is very, very interesting. 
so we read it, we read it, and we tried it, and then uh, it was like, okay, we can delete all the mocks in our project. We can really have very very simple tests. Okay, so what we discovered in and what was released in, in Reframe in that moment, it was August last year, was this effects and co-effects, okay? I'm going to define them so you know what they are and then we will see about them. Effects are, uh, what they are doing, they are a description of the side effect your program is going to do, okay? It's just a description of, of a side effect. And co-effects, what they are doing is tracking the side causes that of your programs, tracking the data your programs need from the world. Okay? Uh, so, this is a pattern, declarative effects pattern or effects as data pattern. You can find it in many different languages. In some places you have to do it. In some places you have a framework. In some places the language is doing it for you. But what you have is or the result is going to be that the event handlers are going to be pure functions again. Uh, they are going to receive co-effects and they are going to return effects. They are going to receive the data they need and they are going to return descriptions of the effects that someone will do. Who is someone? Well, it can be the language runtime in Elm or it can be a framework like in Reframe or it can be yourself that you have done some code to, to do that, okay? Uh, <coughs> I recommend this talk. He's Richard Feldman, uh, effects as, of data and, as data, and it's really good. He, he tells you how to do it in JavaScript, uh, but also at the end he says, okay, forget JavaScript, use Elm, okay? But uh, it's very good and he has the time to, to go into it because the talk is all the time about that and I don't have the time, so I <laughs> recommend it to you. So what we, what we get back is the good thing about pure event handlers. Logger reasoning, easier testing, and events replayability. We, we, we get that back. And that's really, really good because now, if we compare with the complexity of the previous test, this one is very easy. We are receiving the coeffect uh, map, which is all the things that you need. In this case, it's only the app state. And uh, when you, you uh, execute that event handler, what you are going to receive is the effects. We have two effects here. This is what you, the DB effect, what you are going to update in the state. And this is a dispatch later effect that is telling you after this time, dispatch that. And some other place in your code is going to do that, okay? So what you are going to have is a pure functional core, okay? All your business logic is going to be pure functional. And uh, to this functional core, it's going to be driven by events that come here, and it's, it's going to use coeffects, and it's going to always to return effects, okay? Um, so how, how, how are effects and coeffects handled, okay? Someone has to do something with them. So yeah, you, if you see my graphics art, <laughs> uh, well, you, you are going to have coeffect handlers, and effect handlers, it's like, Easy, they are the handlers of that. And what they do is that he's going to, to know uh, when you, you register that in a framework, and you're going to tell the framework that a, a, a given event handler needs a given coeffect, okay? So he's going to inject it. Before it's called, he's going to inject the data there. And the other th way around, you're going to register this effect handler saying that any time you this effect appears in the system, he's going to handle it. He knows how to interpret this description and do the, the side effect, okay? So, what you will have is this, you remember some time ago, this functional core imperative shell that Gary Berhand, or I don't know how to pronounce his name, sorry, uh, he, he was talking about that. This is what we're going to have, okay? All the core is pure functional, and then you have a thin, or yeah, depends. Thin layer that is effectful and knows how to do the imperative things, okay? Uh, so in Reframe, there are a lot of built-in uh, effect handlers and there are a lot of contributed ones by the community. The important ones, the one that you're using all the time is this one, the, the, the DV one, which is the one that up 
updates the state. And uh, you have this part, this part later, many of them. Uh, and also you have CoFX handlers. And this is the, 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 the most important one, the one that gets the data from the DB, OK, and puts it in, in your uh, event handler. And, and it's very easy to, to create them, OK? You just need to, to know the, sh the description, the shape of the description, and interpret that. And then you register it into the framework. So this is a more, like, I don't know how to say, precise, maybe? Uh, a description of, of how Refrain works. The other one was simplified, but this is how it works. Uh, when, when you receive this event, uh, it's going to, if it needs to, take some co-effects from, from the surroundings, from the world, like the DV or the time, for instance, and, or other ones that are here. And then it's going to, to do some effects, like in this case, you have this effect DV, and someone is going to interpret that and update the model. Or you can have this dispatch or dispatch later that produce a new event and it start working. So you have this, but you can also uh, have logic that go again and, and produce some process until it ends, right? Uh, so, yeah. So, and you have a DV effect. Uh -huh. There is some kind of, uh, let's say, observers that react to this change, or how does this work? How does it work? OK. So what you have is that you, you register. In the case of DB, it's built in. So you really don't see this. You don't have to do anything. Just describe, I'm going to do this change to the, to the app state, and he's going to do it. Uh, for instance, if, if this one, the time, is not built in, but it's very easy to, 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 to do. But this one is a co-effect. So what you do here is just uh, you put in a function, uh, the, the function that gets the date, OK? Right. And add that to, to a co-effect map that, that comes in the parameter. And you add the time. You put like a, this time and the result of the function. And do you register that as a co-effect handler, OK? And then you, when you are registering a, an event handler that needs that, you say, OK, this needs a, this co-effect. So every time that event happens, he's going to call that and in that moment injects the, the time. More or less, it, you can, there are, at the end of there are a couple of articles that, that you can see all the code bit by bit. So the second thing we, we learned that was very good for us was this, uh, subscriptions and reactivity. So if we go to the simplified version, uh, now we're going to talk about this part that we ignore in the, in the previous explanation, the subscriptions. What they, they are, it's like, it's, it's a signal graph it's the duplicated and it's running query functions all the time over your app state, OK? And they are very interesting because they are going to extract data from the app state and uh, elaborate it. So when it gets to the view, it's, uh, you don't have to do anything in the views. Uh, and this is an example. Uh, imagine that I have my, in the REPL, I do that, so I see the app DB, and my app DB is name, Pepe, and maybe some other stuff we are not interested in. And then we create this subscription here that is ch taking the, the name from the DB, and this other subscription that is using the previous one here, and it's just greeting whatever name is there. Okay, so in some view, we are going to have this code, we are going to subscribe to greeting to this one, OK? So a good way to visualize this is imagining that it's like an Excel, Excel uh, spreadsheet, or I don't know how to say it. Uh, so you have your app DV. You have this extraction here, function. And then you have the computation. And this is your view, which is a function as well. So every time you change this, it's like it's Excel. Excel, you have this change reaction, and everything updates, OK? So 
Why is this interesting? Uh, no? OK, this one. It's interesting because of two things, mainly. Your model is going to be simpler, OK? Because we are not going to have to keep derived state, and we are not going to, be, to have logic for keeping derived state in sync and all that uh, noise, OK? And another interesting thing is that we are going to dump down the views. The views are going to be really, really simple, OK? No logic at, at all, only translating events and subscribing to things. So, and also we have this. We can improve performance uh, because um, it can help you to reduce the renderings. And it can also duplicate computations, OK? Uh, I will explain it better this way, OK? Every time we load a view, we are going to create this graph from the bottom up, from what we need to the app DB, OK? And then every time something changes in the app DB, it's going to compute, well, the extraction is going to do all the ones that need, OK? But then it's going to go down, and it's going to compare the previous value with, with the new value. And if they are the same, it doesn't go on, OK? And also, if you have to pass more than once through a node, uh, it's only computed once, OK? In this case, we don't have that, because it's very, a very easy example. But this is a, a real example in our code. And you see that it can get a bit more convoluted. And there are some that many, several of them needs. But they are computed only once. And any time in the graph, when it doesn't change the value, it doesn't go on. Okay? So you avoid the renderings without having this, I don't remember the method in React that you have for a will update, or I don't remember, because I don't use it. So I don't remember any of them. Okay? Another interesting thing is that we learn is that uh, for us, it was really, really easy to model the UI as fi fini finite state machines. And this is something that if you see again this unidirectional data flow architecture, you will see that everything is driven by events. It can be events that comes from some UI event, or it can be something that you decide to dispatch okay? from, from some uh, effect. And so it's an event driven data flow. And this really uh, goes much very well with thinking about it as a finite state machines. And, and what we ended doing is having like very short, short sessions discussing the events we were going to have and the states drawing some bit of that, and then we start pre-programming. And it was really a really nice flow. Uh, so that's for it. So in the end, what we can see is that every time that you are uh, working in some system with a given design or a given architecture, it can be your legacy code, it can be some framework, uh, you, you, you are going to to be constrained. The design that exists constrains you in a way. But it can be in a good way or in a bad way. Okay? Sometimes you are like Sisyphus. I don't know if it's pronounced like that, but you are fighting against the, 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 the framework or you're fighting against the design. You need to do a lot of work to get to a sweet spot. And anytime you stop doing it, it falls down. Okay? So you need to be good and you need to be very disciplined. But it can be much easier if you are in a, in a situation in which the design is helping you, OK? So it's difficult to do the wrong things. Uh, so this, this is something that I think is a nice idea. It's, I'm going to read that <laughs> A well-designed system makes it easy to do the right things and annoying, but not impossible, to do the wrong things. It's Jeff Atwood. And, I recommend this talk from Mark Seaman. It's very interesting about functional architecture. It's the title, The, the Pits of Success, where he talks about several bits of success, like uh, ports and adapters, domain-driven design, functional architecture, and compare them. And it's very interesting. So what we, what we argue is that using reframe that has these only pure functions for business logic 
isolated, effectful code. Easy to, to uh, and like a very easy, like matching with, with an interesting model. And the subscriptions that help you to reduce compl accidental complexity, you are in a pit of success. It was really easy to do it, really easy to test, and a lot of fun. We didn't have to be good to do it. So if you are using Redux, uh, you, you can have this experience. You can have declarative effects if you use Redux, Redux Saga or Redux Loop uh, libraries, and you can have those ones are inspired in Elm by Elm, but you can have also subscriptions if you, if you use the reselect library that is directly inspired by Reframe, okay? So you can do it as well. So uh, all this, the consequence of all this was that uh, in the end, we had a huge reuse, okay, between the mobile and the browser uh, versions. Because the only things that were different were the views, and the views didn't have any logic, just dispatching and, and subscribing to things. This is a browser one. This is a, 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 a mobile one using uh, Expo. Um, well, the, the events are different, but then you dispatch to the same thing. Um, and the other thing that is a bit different are the effect handlers. Not all of them, some of them are the same if they are talking to doing some Ajax or talking, but other ones like talking to a local storage, things like that, they are different. You have to do a version for the browser and a version, different version for uh, React Native. And that's all. All the rest of the code is the same, the, everything. Uh, so now this is a fair question, I think, because at the beginning we said, okay, we're using ClojureScript because we're fanboys, we wanted to do it. And after the project, you can think, okay, what did that give us? Uh, for most of people, when they talk about Clojure script or Clojure, they think it's about parentheses. Ugh. But what we see is like they are. Parentheses are elegant weapons, but after the yoke. So we found that, well, it's a some functional language. And we have these immutable data structures uh, that goes well with these uh, unidirectional data flow architectures that are functional in nature. So you don't have to be careful with the language. It's, it goes with, the, with what you want to do. Uh, we have powerful standard library reference types and also lightweight, but very powerful polymorphism. So we, we, we had a, a really nice tool here. Also, and this is very important, the, the experience of development. It's really interactive. If you, it has a, a really powerful REPL and FIGWIL tool uh, that injects the changes in code, etc., in in your application without losing state, and so, so, so the experience is very nice, and in a way it changes your flow. Uh, we were doing, we were two, we were doing pair programming, we were doing TDD, but we 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 discovered that we could have faster cycle feedbacks if we also introduced this REPL driven development. Okay, so we were working with the two things at the time, and for some things, uh, having access to, to your running application and being able to play with it is, is a really nice experience. And uh, if your language is, doesn't have that, that kind of tool, it's, for me, it's dif difficult to explain. It's something that you need to like, experience to, to, to see, but, but trust me that, that it's very nice. And we also avoided this, this JSS tooling fatigue. For me, it's really complicated. So many things that they have to do just to start. It's a bit easier, only having one tool. So, but in the end, all this, it's not, it's not a silver bullet, okay? Uh, the hard things are still hard, okay? You have to, even though you are starting in a really good position, a really sweet spot, uh, you still have to work hard to to get good naming, to model your domain, to discover useful as abstractions, uh, organize your code. It's not magic, okay? But, but it puts you in, in a good place because you don't have so much accidental complexity. So another problem we faced was that we, were, we are living in, on the bleeding edge 
uh, because Expo is very young and it's evolving very quick. So the closure script binding is all the time catching up. Okay, and we had to do some uh, pull requests to the project, etc. And but but in the end, for us, it's worth it because uh, it Expo helps us to to avoid having two versions, two versions, once, one, one for iOS and another for Android. Uh, before using Expo, we were using Renatal, which is a previous uh, script project to work with React Native, and we, have, we had to maintain both. Uh, so when we discovered Expo, we, it was like, okay, we forget about that version. We have only one mobile version, okay? And in the end, as more people, uh, start using it and it gets older, it's going to, to get better, okay? Because it's, it's going to stabilize. So another big problem is this one. Uh, the, this shape coupling, I don't know how to call it, but it's probably kind of primitive obsession or I don't know. So you have to do an effort to avoid that your code knows too much about the shape of, of, of the app state uh, about the app state representation, okay? Uh, this is especially important in your test, so we have to, to use builders to protect us from that. And, okay, I'm getting to my conclusion, so we're going to finish soon. Uh, so in the end, we succeed in getting the goal we, 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 we had, uh, which is that, that the mobile browser and mobile versions uh, share most of, of its code. At the same time, uh, we experienced this, uh, that ref using refrain removes a lot of accidental complexity and, and well, it puts you in, in that pit of success situation, no? And Clojure script was a nice tool to use, okay? Sound language and this interactive development flow is, is really nice. And th that's all, thanks. Okay, I went too fast. <laughs> So well, if, if you want to talk about it, or I didn't go too fast, and I don't know. <laughs> so. It gets reduced a bit, because uh, in the sense that uh, the, there is a lot of triangulation that in, you can do much faster working on the REPL. And depending on how you work, uh, imagine not writing on the console, but having like a notepad, you write there and you send things to the REPL. Uh, you get to what you want and then you have your examples there and you can copy them and they are your tests. If you want to keep them all, or if not, you have, you want, you, if you have the knowledge, or the experience, you you can keep only the tests that are useful for you. Because sometimes when you're triangulating, you get to the end and you say, okay, maybe this test is redundant or whatever, and you delete it. And in that case, this is very fast because you are just trying your, your functions in the moment. So for me, it's not a substitute or of TDD. It's like uh, a complement. I don't know how to say supplement. Maybe <laughs> okay. So like, like it helps you and. Uh, it's good for because the, the, the cycle of feedback gets a little bit shorter. And that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So you mentioned about um, how you can model the uh, state as a final state machine, mm -hmm. which is pretty cool. Um, I've found when, whenever looking at a Redux reducer, I find it difficult to, because it's so flat and there's only one tree. Uh, I found it difficult to quite to see to follow around the planet state machine if you see what I mean. Like it's you have to actually work through where you started from and where you're going. It's not uh, implicit by look, just looking at the reducer. Is that the same? Is that the problem that and do you still have to think about it and then go okay? We, I'm in this state now. Now I'm in these other states. And it's just clear from the code. The thing is that using Reframe, you reduce a lot the, the boilerplate you have in Redux, okay? So it's more framework-like. Well, it's a framework. <laughs> so in the end, you end, uh, you end up writing only the, 
the event handler and the effect or co-effect handlers if you need them. Sometimes you, it doesn't have side effects and you just write that. So for us, what we saw is like uh, we had this sort design sessions thinking on what we wanted to do, which events were important for that, and thinking a bit about, well, just a bit, a bit of drawing, okay, we're going to, and then, but it wasn't final, okay, well, then we went to, we started to, to code, and we were flexible in saying, okay, we were wrong, and we, it's easier this way or that way. So it's a bit of exploring, the good thing is that uh, you are focusing the parts that are important, you don't have to do a lot of boilerplate like you have in, in, in Redux. But I'm telling this from one month of studying really hard Redux because I, want, I was going to talk about this and I said, okay, I need to know a bit more of Redux <laughs> because I haven't used it, okay, in, in, in earnest, so don't take, take what I say with a grain of salt, okay? Thank you. You're welcome. So, one of the things that I really don't like about Redux is the way that you have to bind your your views with the state and all all the you know the primary that you see over over your code that it's mm -hmm. all, all the things that you are doing in, in your in your approach uh, sus subscription and how the subscription works with views is okay. easier the code is cleaner in, in this way because. Yeah, I'm going to. The, the only thing you have to do is this: <coughs> subscribe to, and, and the name of the subscription. And every, any any time that changes, this is going to be updated, and this is going to to be rendered again. So this this is the only thing you have to do in your in your view. The only thing, nothing else. So the code that you have in in the method that you have to define. In order to get the properties and transform the properties to update the, the local. All, all that plumbing, all this that boilerplate. The, the subscription. Yeah, subscriptions is, this, is that, that you change state and you have this reactive signal that does uh, like many transformations blah, 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 until you get what you want and then you subscribe to that. Okay? Uh, instead of subscribing to this and then call something, do that. Okay? But for me, that part is the session, the state management uh, is like totally free of the framework, okay? Because it's pure functional, you call it from, you, you call it from outside. If you had some, something similar, you could substitute the frame. This part, the subscriptions are not like that because you could have like, I could imagine I could extract how to compute that uh, to a function and call it. Uh, and look for some way. The problem is that you introduce complexity here because I, I need to know when it needs to be called to avoid the renderings and blah, blah, okay? I don't want to, to call it every time, so I remove all that complexity from here, putting that in subscriptions, okay? Uh, but at the same time, uh, in that part, you are into the framework. So uh, I recommend it as a, uh, I mean, when you do, when you see a, a graph like this one, I recommend this as, as an optimization because you, most of them you are using them a lot, and you want to go really fast. That's when you put that into the subscription as different subscriptions. If you don't have that problem, it's only used once. Uh, you can create just one node and your function is outside, it's pure and it's super testable. The other way you have like small functions, all of them are tested, but if you want to test the whole thing from here to, to the view, you have to test with the framework. So th this is the part that is, uh, well, not framework free, but it gives you a lot, so I accept the, <laughs> the, the problem, okay? And I don't know if I answered your question. I would like to know, 
because last night I drove this one. <laughs> and I had to draw a previous one with the name of the things because I was like crazy, oh, is this one, is that one, or whatever. And then I put it behind and put the other paper on top and <laughs> did drew all of that. So I would love to know. I don't know, but probably it will appear because it's, it's nice to visualize that. So let's see. The, there are some new tools for instrumenting the reframe that are really nice. I don't remember the name. So you can see what's happening in real time while you are developing, and they are beautiful. I've seen some talks using that, but I don't remember the name. And, and they imp improve a lot also the interactive development feeling. Mm. <clears throat> I have some kind of uh, social question or philosophical. Is, um, that this is built up on like, very powerful abstractions and concepts. No? And how do you think you can master this when you are like a, um, a procedural programmer, an imperative programmer? Because you have like, yeah, like functional programming, immutability, then you have this uh, data flow, that's directional data flow, and then you have B-frame and mm -hmm. all these kind of things. <coughs> I think it's uh, like uh, very powerful, but uh, you need like a lot of time to master, no? If, if I tell you how I learned it, maybe you will change your mind. Because I started working with Francesc, and Francesc told me, okay, we have this framework. I didn't have any clue of that. And he said, we have this function uh, that is changing the state. When we have an event, you, use, you have to put a function there, okay? Uh, and, uh, and instead of doing the thing, you tell what you are going to do. And instead of calling the thing, you tell what you need, okay? And I started that way, and for me it was easy to do, for me it was much easier to do that than using jQuery or uh, playing JavaScript that it was like difficult to see where the things were coming, who was changing what. Uh, so maybe you don't need to tell the, all the concepts, just play with it, and it's very nice to do because you are, you have this fig wheel tool and you change something and you immediately see it on the browser and then you change something in the ripple and you see it and so if the person has go over the barrier of closure script, the parentheses and all that probably that one is but I think it's not going to be that bad because you don't have to go into the concepts from the beginning. You can just use them and and play with them and with some toy project and and later you can tell, okay, this you were using is a call effect or something like that. But yeah, yeah, probably I'm talking from where I am now and I have forgotten where I was and I know, so don't, maybe I'm wrong. <laughs> so it's, it has, you, you have to learn things, yeah. It's true, but playing and trying, I think it can make it easier. Uh, no, we, we went to reframe the thing with with Omnex. In at that time, it was really new. At, at the same time, we compared the documentation and we saw that reframe documentation is really good. A lot of documentation and Omnex documentation is nowhere. <laughs> it's the code. So we said, okay, maybe we we'll go with the one with documentation. I'm using Om at the work at work now, and it's. It's very verbose because it's very similar to React. You need to know all the, the life cycle methods and here you don't need to use them. I didn't know them. I had been doing Clojure script for six months and then I came to this work, new job, and said, okay, <laughs> what's that? Because I haven't used it though. I didn't know React. And now I'm learning a lot of React because I have to use that. That is like very close. This one has like an abstraction that hides a lot of React complexity. So reagent, uh, uh, for me, reagent is nicer, but well, it's a matter of, I work with both and I prefer reagent.
regarding the UI modelization as a thin steel machine, mm -hmm. do you use any technique for not forgetting uh, some corner cases, for example? We, we, we don't do it very formally. We use it as a way of, I don't know, of thinking about what we're going to do, like get into an agreement, we're going to do more or less this, and we draw it and very informal, and then we start pair programming. So, yeah, we are not doing it like very by so the book or... The way. You don't try to draw everything from, from No, scratch. just to, to have a clue of what we are going to, to do. It was nice because we, we get to that conclusion, we started to use it, and I don't know, like this year, Cog Cognitech people had, had uh, published, they are the guys uh, behind Clojure, they, they published like two po posts in their blog about using uh, finite state machines as, uh, to model the UI and all that, with a frame, and we said, okay, we are not that mad, right? So it was like good for us. So, okay. I don't know if uh, it's okay. okay. So, thank you very much for coming. And <laughs>